You're listening to the Pharmacy Podcast Network. If you or your patients struggle with muscle cramps, spasms, soreness, or restless leg syndrome, you're going to want to hear about our non-opioid TheraWorks Relief. TheraWorks Relief is a clinically proven and published locally acting topical solution that prevents and relieves muscle cramps, spasms, and soreness in the legs and feet. In a research study including patients diagnosed with restless leg syndrome, TheraWorks Relief was shown to reduce symptoms commonly associated with accompanying RLS, including muscle cramps and spasms. Muscle cramps are reported as a side effect of hundreds of prescription medications, from intravenous iron sucrose and conjugated estrogens to statins and diuretics. By managing muscle cramps, TheraWorks Relief supports adherence, helping patients stay on important and often life-saving medications. TheraWorks Relief comes in an easy-to-use, fast-absorbing, non-greasy foam that can prevent muscle cramps and spasms with just a few simple applications a day. To learn more about TheraWorks Relief, go to theraworksrelief.com and click on the Healthcare Professional link. Here's the thing, you're busy. You're a professional. Maybe you're a pharmacist, and you know you're capable of doing more, doing much more, and living a more organized, less stressful, purposeful, and freedom-driven life. Let's talk, let's share, and let's grow together as an industry, as healthcare providers, and as a better unified community. It may seem like some of these things don't easily fit together, After all, what do career coaching, marketing strategy, networking, and pharmacy have in common? Welcome to the Rx Buzz. Your host is a pharmacist, a wife, a mother, an entrepreneur, and a proven motivational career coach, Ashley Clevens Hayes. This is the Rx Buzz Podcast, a collaboration between Rx Ashley and the Pharmacy Podcast Network. Good morning, RX Buzz listeners. Ashley here from RX Ashley and the RX Buzz Pharmacy Podcast Network. And I have an awesome guest for you guys today. We connected most like a lot of my guests um, via a social media platform. Sharon Karina from ProCE is with me. So give her a big shout out. But before we jump into the podcast, I wanted to see if you guys could do me a huge favor. Go on to our review section of the Pharmacy Podcast Network and give us a shout out. It helps me build more, I don't know, just build more. When you build reviews, you get higher rankings in podcasts. And that really, really helps us in growing this platform and getting more unique, cool, awesome guests on this show, just like Sharon. So without further ado, Sharon Karina, welcome to our podcast. Thank you. Thank you. I'm so excited. I know, me too. I think the listeners will really enjoy learning more about you and your path and um, just what you're up to these days. So tell us a little bit about yourself. I know it's a big loaded question, but talk to us about your current passions and what you're up to right now. Yeah, absolutely. Um, So I really have to think about this a lot. Um, I'm actually a huge nerd and very passionate about learning. So I'm into a lot of self-development, kind of understanding who I am, what's my place in the world, so I do a lot of reading. Um, But on a more personal level, I recently discovered polo. So in the spring of this year, I took part in a polo school, and it was amazing. Um, I love riding horses, but I'm not really too brave with it because it's kind of dangerous, and they're flighty animals. So it's like riding a giant rabbit that could kill you. But when I was doing the polo school and actually taking place in a trucker or a game, I wasn't even thinking about the horse. I was just, I was so into figuring out how to get to the ball and running down the line and my teammates, where are my teammates? Like I didn't think about any of my doubts. Right. So I loved it. Um, I haven't figured out how to crack a door into making it happen yet um, because polo is very, very expensive and I just don't have that kind of liquidity, but it was just a really amazing experience. So I'm kind of trying to learn like, how can I make this work? Um, And then looking at the more introspective perspective, right? Of why do I love this so much? And thinking about how doubts kind of hold me back. Hopefully that's not too ethereal, but I, I really had to stop and consider what that meant to me and, and kind of where I was going. What? So, okay. So 
polo and how did you get into polo? Um, <laughs> that's a great question. Uh, I actually saw an ad on Facebook for wow. a polo school. So Facebook uh, ads do still work. Okay. Everyone yes, they do. They do. Ads are, but um, okay. Good to know. <laughs> <laughs> Try it out. Um, but yeah, I, I saw an ad and they said, if you can sit on a horse, you can play polo. And I was like, Hmm, well I can sit on a horse. So I signed up for it, not really knowing what I was getting into. And it was just wild. I mean, there are a lot of people that either had experience with polo or people who have never been on a horse before. Um, and we figured it out, right? So, so would tell me like, about your experiences with polo and how, are you trying new things out or yeah. are you just going for it? Tell me about how this is kind of indirectly or directly related to possibly your career. Yeah, yeah. So it's trying out something new and being brave. That's really what it boils down to, right? Because I have a little bit of anxiety about falling off horses. Um, I've been kind of doing some schooling jumping over fences over the last couple of years. I've had a couple of falls, um, not, not so fun falls, right? Um, so when I saw this ad, I was like, man, why don't I just try this? Maybe this will help me overcome my fear a little bit. And I didn't realize how much it was going to affect me, you know, like I alluded to earlier, just this thought of being on this horse and, and knowing that I could get injured, but being so into the game and not even paying attention to any of the doubts in my mind, any of the chatter that we kind of hear that says, oh, don't do that. You're going to get right. hurt or, you know, don't go that way or you should just slow down. I didn't even think about it. So it related a lot in hindsight to kind of how I approach my career uh -huh. and how I approach my self-development because we let our doubts hold us back so much. Totally. And it's so human to hear these voices and, and just chatter in your mind that it's normal, right? So when it disappears, like in an instance when I was on this polo horse, I was like, whoa, wait a second here. <laughs> there's, there's, there's no voice saying, don't do that be afraid. Don't fall mm -hmm. off. Like I, I really was just tuned in to the goal and being with my teammates. And I think that speaks volumes to kind of how I have to be careful in my professional life to not let the doubts creep in and totally. to not let the doubts affect me for taking any opportunities that may come about. Agreed. So, okay. Talk to me about kind of your journey through your career yeah. You have a great, great story. So I'm super excited for the listeners to hear about kind of your journey through pharmacy school and, and how you got from there to here. Yeah. So what a lot of people don't realize is that pharmacy school was a dream for me. Um, and what ended up happening in my life wasn't really traditional. So I was a non-traditional student. Um, when I was in high school, uh, my parents relocated to Texas, and I'll date myself a little bit by saying when we relocated, Texas was just starting the No Child Left Behind Act. <laughs> in high school. Yeah. Um, so when I moved down to Texas, uh, they didn't accept most of my credits, and instead of being a senior in high school, I was demoted to freshman. So I ultimately dropped out of high school um, because that just was not going to happen. Um, and then I started. That's crazy. Yeah. Yeah. And, and, you know, part of it too is that we lived in a very rural area mm -hmm. and I don't know that my parents were equipped with the best way to handle sure. it. So there just wasn't really a solution for it other than me getting my GED and just starting to work. Got it. Okay. Um, so I ended up getting a job in the telecom industry as a customer service agent while I was still in Texas and decided to move back to Chicago where my grandparents were living. And, um, always just wanted to go to school. You know, I, I miss that part of my life. I missed having that experience of learning because like I said, learning is very important to me. And um, eventually I got to a place where I saved up enough money to go to a junior college and um, got my associate's degree with the plan of going into pharmacy because I love medicine and I loved understanding why things are working. Uh, so pharmacy was a natural fit. When I got into pharmacy school, I had this huge idea about community pharmacy specifically, where I thought, you know, this isn't working out. 
people aren't happy and they're our best resource and this volume based system that that retail is using there's got to be another way to monetize it right and then the bottom up approach doesn't really work in community though so when i started my introductory rotations in community pharmacy, I got a wake up call that all these thoughts and ideas and plans that I had, um, you know, were, were a little, little naive in that if I graduated from pharmacy school and just went into a community pharmacist position, I don't know that I would have been able to achieve them. So I thought, oh my gosh, like how, <laughs> how does anybody do this? How do they make a big change? And, um, from what I saw, you have to get, you know, additional degrees, maybe a business degree or something like that and kind of move in from a different direction. So that was disappointing. Um, going into my second year of pharmacy school, uh, a couple of pivotal things happened. Uh, unfortunately, I went through a divorce and that was very, very difficult. Um, it was extremely hard to try to balance learning a large volume of information with my personal life just falling apart. And I wasn't even sure where I was going to live because while we were going through the separation process, he was kind of supporting me and I hadn't taken out more student loans and I didn't really know how, how all that worked since I'm one of the first people in my family to go to college. Right. And um, I focused a lot on school because now I thought, oh, shoot, <laughs> um, what am I going to do? Like, how am I going to support myself? I really got to figure out what I'm going to do with this degree. So during that time period, I had the opportunity to join uh, an extracurricular student leadership institute that Midwestern University, my, my school, hosted, and uh, other students from around the state were able to participate in. And Within this program, they provided a paper with a directory of mentors. And we were assigned one mentor, but I saw all these people and I thought, well, what did they do? If I'm not going to do community pharmacy, then maybe I should just reach out to these people and mm -hmm. see, you know, how did you get to where you are now? Mm -hmm. What do you enjoy about it? What are your thoughts? Like, how can somebody like me reach? the goals that you've reached. Mm -hmm. um, so I ended up <laughs> reaching out to everyone and uh, I skipped classes to go meet with them. Um, I found that face-to-face -face meetings were a lot more successful in a way because you get to know the person a little bit better. Mm -hmm. having those so meetings. you knew from the get-go how to get in front of people's faces, which is half the battle, right? Yeah, yeah. And, it, it, and that's the thing, you know, what I've done is not novel. Anyone yeah. can go and reach out to people and say, hey, uh -huh. do you have, can I meet you for coffee? Yeah. Can, you know, do you have five, 10 minutes? Um, I think where people kind of falter when it comes to networking is that they're thinking about themselves a lot. Yes, like, can totally. Me, what can yeah. I get out of this? Yes. And that's not the approach that I took because I really just wanted to hear who, who are they? Mm -hmm. What was their story? What was their journey like? Did they have you know, the kind of experiences that I've had while I was in pharmacy school where, you know, I didn't know what I was going to be doing, right? Mm -hmm. uh, so it was really, it was really helpful. And that ultimately led to, you know, a lot of really great advice. Um, but then I met with uh, Jesse Kodas from Northwestern Memorial Hospital, and um, she really took me under her wing and pushed me way out of my comfort zone. Uh, and served as a mentor and a sponsor with regards to the Women in Leadership initiative that ASHP has. Um, so I was able to take part in some of the research where it came uh, to student perspectives and how many students were women coming into pharmacy school and, and what does women in leadership really mean? So that led to recognition from ASHP and then um, also a panel discussion opportunity for a CE program at ICHP, our, our state AC, ASHP affiliate, um, so which I was cool. terrified of doing, right? Of so course, this is of course. Thing where uh, Desi said, okay, we're, we're going to do this panel discussion. I'd like you to be part of it. And I thought, oh, great. So I said, yes, of course. But I was like, what am I going to do? What do you mean I have to be in front of people and talk and do a presentation? I'd never done that before, right? Except for school presentations. 
but it was, it was wild. It was a great experience. So many things I'm hearing from you right now is first and foremost, um, having mentorship is something that is so powerful. Yeah. So being able to identify at whatever phase in your career, right? If you're obviously you were a student, but all the way through, I don't know if you're CEO or if you're doing big, great things, you still need that support. Mm -hmm. How do you think people can find a mentor? Um, Maybe, I think it's a little bit easier when you're a student, even though students, I think, don't recognize that it's a little bit easier, but because they have a lot of their fingertips, but (laughs) maybe people like who are in our phase of their career, um, do you have any tips for them? Because, and and my second question for you is, a lot of people turn to me and they ask me, well, I'm an introvert. I don't know how to talk to people or network. And it's, what are your thoughts on that? And two questions, because I have so much for you. <laughs> I just love talking with you. So the power of mentorship and, and kind of how um, your mentors have guided you through your career, your early, early career, they laid the foundation for you. Yeah. And then the introvert and extrovert thing. So I think I'm going to start with the introvert extrovert thing yeah. because it segues nicely into meeting people and networking and, and developing a mentor mentee relationship or even sponsorship. Um, so most people think that I'm extroverted, but I'm not. Uh, it's, I am very introverted and it was difficult for me to go outside of my shell and silence the doubts and to just go out and meet people. Um, But a couple of things happened. One, during my divorce, I was operating from a place of, okay, I got to figure out my life. So I had that fear motivation pushing me through the fear of going out and meeting people and what their expectations are, how to actually communicate, right? You kind of didn't have a choice. You were like, this is it. I got to take advantage of these situations. Yeah. Yeah. So as a lot of people are somewhat complacent mm -hmm. and so they don't necessarily need to change. Like they don't feel the absolute fire under them that it's like, Oh my gosh, if I don't take advantage of this opportunity, who knows what's next. Right. So I do think it's twofold. Yeah. Yeah. That's, that's really dangerous because there's so many different opportunities out there that people are just missing. Totally. Develop their career that can put them into a path that makes them happier than Mm -hmm. where they're at right now. So it's something that you have to really think about. Um, so overcoming that initial fear of going out and meeting people was step one. And the only way to do that is to just do it. Right. So as a student, I think students have a huge advantage because people are more likely to talk to students. So you can, you can cold call people. You can cold email people and say, listen, I'm a student and I'm, you know, I'm really exploring some paths and what you're doing is really interesting. Do you have some time? to sit down with me and, and tell me your story, mm-hmm. right? And most people said yes. <laughs> um, so it's really important to try to take advantage of that as you're a student. Now, when you get a little bit progressed in your career and you're no longer a student, there is definitely a difference, but it still requires you going out and putting yourself out there. So you can do the same thing. You can, you can cold call people. You can talk to your boss and say, hey, listen, I'm interested in learning more about this. Do you know someone? And then get an introduction that way or volunteering in an organization. Mm-hmm. I, I volunteer with the Healthcare Business Women's Association, and I meet a lot of people who aren't necessarily pharmacists who are in really interesting positions mm-hmm. and doing really neat things with their lives, right? So it's just putting yourself in front of people, and whatever you need to do to do it, just figure it out and say, yes, I've got it. Yeah, and I think what you're saying is visibility. Yeah. And being known for something and kind of just starting. Yeah. Um, I totally agree with you. A lot of people um, hide behind the computer screen or Mm -hmm. maybe they're just too fearful. They just don't know. They say that they don't know how to start. Right. But just starting somewhere is kind of what you did. You had this sheet of paper with mentors and you're like, man, I'm just going to call all of them. (laughs) Yeah, exactly. And I'm probably going to hear back from maybe one or two, but at least it's going to be one and two and not zero. Right. And that's okay. I mean, the benefits of you doing that whole cold calling thing with the mentorship, what did that turn into for you? Wow. So, you know, with that, I learned about a lot of different paths. So during my third going into fourth year of pharmacy school, I really started thinking about residency, um, specifically doing a PGY2 in admin. 
um, something came up about management consulting. Now it wasn't through a pharmacist, it was actually through somebody that a pharmacist knew. And um, I got sucked into the six month hole of thinking, oh my God, like management consulting, that's, that's so cool. And I got invited to a very large management consulting firm to kind of go to their information sessions and um, figure out like, was this, was this who I am? Like problem solving the way that they do it in these firms? Um, gosh, fellowships. I mean, this led to so many different opportunities because as I started to remove the fear of talking to people, I started to just reach out to more people, right? So I can even just go on LinkedIn and pick somebody in New York and say, hey, listen, you know, I'm a student, you're doing something really cool. You know, would you mind if we had like a 20 minute phone call just talking about your experiences and, and how you got to your position? That's the approach that I really, really appreciate about you and in this networking 101 little talk we're having, <laughs> uh, basically making sure that, so, so you're not just asking for a job. So I get a lot of LinkedIn messages and which is awesome. I mean, I, I love, I love hearing from the people who are listening. I love hearing from the audience who are reading our blogs. I love hearing from clients who are doing awesome, cool things. But a lot of times I get people asking me for a job. Oh my gosh. A lot, a lot like probably daily. Um, and I don't even know them. I'm like, I don't know. I don't know you. So how am I supposed to recommend you or refer you to someone if I don't know? And your LinkedIn profile is blank. So, um, it, it, it's harder for me. And here's the thing, like, I love to connect people. Like that's something that I really enjoy connecting people who are just doing cool things or just looking for jobs or just looking for new <laughs> ideas but when I don't know the person, it's hard. So networking 101 is making sure that you build a relationship. Yeah. Yeah. And that, that's really important. And I even get messages with people yeah. I don't know looking for a job, uh, which is really interesting for me because I just graduated in May and I started my position at ProCE in June. So I'm like, oh, I don't know. You just I, started? You just yeah. started? What? I, I didn't know that. June. Oh my yeah. gosh. Oh my yes. gosh. This is, really, really, this is crazy. I did not yeah. know that. Yeah, so it's it's been a wild journey for me. It really has. Wow, Sharon, that's awesome. Yeah, yeah. Okay, so, so talk to us about ProCE and like kind of what your role is. How'd you get how'd you get to that? Oh, so <laughs> this is where that networking comes into play, right? So while I was kind of going through my process during fourth year, um, I had a lot of different areas to look into, right? So I mentioned residency was something that I really, really thought was gonna be my path. I had a couple things working against me with that, though. Um, I, was, I was going through my rotations. I realized that I just wasn't enjoying the clinical work as much as some of my colleagues were, right? So it, it didn't feel like a right fit. And I also had to consider relocation costs at that point as well. Um, I didn't necessarily have the money to pick up and move to do a residency out of state. So I had limitations with that. And um, when I finally sat on this for two, three months to make sure I wasn't, you know, reacting from an emotional place and saying that residency wasn't right for me um, and made the decision to pull the plug. That was, it was hard because here I had this part of my identity and I had a lot of people, a lot of mentors and sponsors supporting me in this decision to try to get into residency and do an admin um, PGY2. And um, I feel like I kind of let them down, right? So what happens after you decide that you don't want to do residency? Well, then I started thinking, I love business. I love strategy. Maybe I should really try to do a fellowship. And we're a little disadvantaged in the Midwest because we don't have a huge pharmaceutical industry presence. Yeah. And, um, like a I fellowship ge geared towards industry? Exactly. Okay. Exactly. So I did those phone calls, right? I started calling current fellows, I started calling associate directors, cold calling people, um, and everybody was really helpful. And I met a lot of really great people. Um, but where I may or may not have faltered during that journey is um, I only applied to five fellowships um, <laughs> during, during PPS at mid-year because I felt that those align more with my interests. I got, I got the interviews and then I got two on-site interview requests for two companies 
that we're both doing it the week after mid-year where I had actually planned a trip. <laughs> so when I got the invitation, I responded immediately to both these companies. And I said, hey, listen, you know, I'm supposed to be going out of town next week. If there's any flexibility, let me know. Otherwise, I can cancel my trip. I didn't hear back from either one of them. Because mm -hmm, they have so and, many applicants. I mean, yeah, they just, yeah. just too much. Exactly, exactly. So then the fellowships dried up. <laughs> right. Everybody had already applied to it. And I was, I was sitting there, you know, at the end of December, like, Oh my God, what am I going to do? What, you know, I, I had these plans. I had all these thoughtfully laid out steps where I was looking into three different directions, management consulting, residency, and then fellowship after I decided residency wasn't the right fit. And uh, none of it worked out. So in January, um, I had an elective rotation at ICHP, the Illinois Council of Health System Pharmacists, and uh, really had no choice but to suck it up. Uh, I, I will say that during this time in my life, during fourth year, um, when I had all these kind of back-to-back -back rejections and um, didn't really have a plan, it was hard. That, that was actually probably my rock bottom, to be honest with you. Outside um, of your divorce and yeah. not graduating high school? Yeah. I mean, wow. Yeah. Because, you know, here, here I was, and usually I'm, I, I consider myself be a pretty resilient person. Um, Cause you know, we, we all go through things in life. We yeah. have to kind of figure out how we respond to it. Yeah. But having so many rejections after I, I really fought during pharmacy school to make sure I got the grades, no matter what else was going on in my life, to make sure I was learning the material and to try to keep my head above water. I fought so hard. And then Come January, I still didn't have a job lined up. Right. And I was panicking because once I graduated in May, oh my God, what am yeah, I going to do? Gonna do? Mm -hmm. um, so my elective ICHP rotation was in January and you just have to suck it up. That forced me to not cry, <laughs> you know, when I came home because I had the job to do. I had to go to this rotation and do the best thing that I could there and be a good team player and be a participant in this. Um, and it was actually one of the best rotations I've ever had because it was just so different and I felt so supported and, you know, I just really enjoyed association work and strategy and, and something more business related. Now this relates into getting my job now because I, I finished my rotation at ICHP and then my last rotation was in community pharmacy and this is right before graduation. And uh, still had no idea what was going on. I got a phone call um, from Trisha ICHP, actually. And she had said, well, hey, are you possibly interested in a business development position at a continuing education company? And I was like, what does that mean? <laughs> yes, seriously. So explain to me the now, definition of that title. Yeah, yeah. So as a student pharmacist, I've never considered continuing education, right? Sure. We, knew that we had to get CEs, but what does that really mean? Like right. who's doing what? what's happening with it? And I had a little bit of experience with that um, at my rotation at ICHP, but not enough to really remember <laughs> what it really was. Mm -hmm. um, so she explained it a little bit and I was like, yeah, I'd, I'd love to find out more. Um, so I had a phone call with uh, Richard Lewis, the CEO of ProCE shortly after that. And it turns out their office was actually five minutes away from my rotation site. Um, so I went and I, I met with him and we talked about the, the company and the business and, and what does it actually mean to be in my position. Mm -hmm. um, and then I got the job offer. So can you yeah. tell us more specifically what he said during that meeting that made you like, oh my gosh, this is going to be it. What is business development for pro CE and what do you kind of do? Well, see, I was hooked uh, when he said he was looking for a pharmacist with entrepreneurial spirit, yeah. right? Uh -huh. So I was like, hey, whoa, I know. this is right up my alley. Yes. Um, What's his name? His name is Richard Lewis. Is he a pharmacist? He is. Oh, I need to meet Richard. Okay. Um, so here's the thing that really, really hooked me on this position. Um, I'm the director of educational development here, and essentially my job is to develop grant proposals to submit to pharmaceutical companies, medical device companies, um, foundations to support CE programming 
Um, we do more than just pharmacists. We do uh, physicians, we do nursing, and a lot of other health careers as well. But since this is a pharmacist-owned company, um, and most of us are pharmacists, we kind of push most of the programming out to pharmacy directly. Um, so what was great about this is I had this prior uh, networking and experience with ASHP and the people that I started to get to know at ASHP, well, I could still use those contacts because mm -hmm. we're satellite symposia at the ASHP conferences. We're doing several programming um, at the mid-year clinical meeting this year, right? Mm -hmm. so, so I didn't lose that after all the work that I put into it during pharmacy school. The second aspect of this is, is that networking component, right? Getting to know people. That's really important because I need to understand, you know, what's important to our stakeholders. We work with two separate societies, um, SIDP and NAS specifically that I kind of work with their educational committees to figure out what do their members need? Right. Like, what are those educational gaps? So we'll sit down and we'll talk about it and we'll figure out what the plan of action is. And then I have to go out and figure out, all right, what companies would be funding in these areas? What do the companies really want to see? Mm -hmm. uh, you know, then I have to hire a medical writer to do a needs assessment. And I work right now, I'm working with medical writers who are pharmacists, which is really helpful because they have that clinical training and that background. And, you know, it's really easy to work with pharmacists for me because I know what access they have and the information they should understand. Yeah. And you can speak their language. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. So once that needs assessment is done and we put the proposal together and get a budget together, I send it out to the pharmaceutical companies and then we figure out what we can work with and how we can develop programming. So, so cool. It's, it's, it's a really interesting job. And this is not something that we learn about in pharmacy school. Exactly. <laughs> not something that you would even like, what jobs can pharmacists do if you're Googling it? I'm right. Sure no, no, nope. it does not exist. Pro CE is not like a perfect trans perfect pharmacist cookie cutter job. This is, right. you're using your transferable skills. You're, you're using your background and your foundation for, from pharmacy, but you're also really leveraging what you're good at is business. Yeah. So yeah. cool. Yeah. So it is to, to wrap this up, I have to ask you a quick question. Yes. Um, to all the pharmacists out there who are kind of looking to do something similar for, from, from their end, like what is, where do you think pharmacy is going in terms of the growth of this sector um, that what, wow. you're, what you're doing and, and kind of explain to us maybe what the opportunities are, not within your company, but your vision and gotcha. what that looks like for you. Yeah. Yeah. I'm, I'm happy to talk about this. I, I don't think um, anybody is surprised to hear that we're a little saturated in traditional pharmacy areas right now. Um, but there are other opportunities out there, right? Uh, you just have to dig for it. So my advice would be to start contacting people who are in interesting positions and asking them, how did that happen? Mm -hmm. I am not the only pharmacist that went into continuing education. There are several other pharmacists that are at different companies that yeah. I've reached out to and I've talked to because I'm like, wait a second, what's medical education? What can you tell me about this? Like, this is a whole new field. Um, so there's no reason why somebody who sees someone doing something interesting can't reach out to them and be like, hey, do you have uh, 15, 20 minutes for a call? I'm really curious about how you did this. Mm -hmm. You know, again, not asking for a job. <laughs> you yeah. know, you never need to start out. You shouldn't be asking them for anything, really, when you're networking with someone initially, because it's just, it's like dating. You don't mm -hmm. show up to a date and ask your date to do something for you. you just get yeah. to know them. <laughs> I like that analogy. Okay, my last question for you and um, is my favorite question from all my mm -hmm. guests is what is the definition or how do you define what success means to you? So I'll go on the flip side of that um, and say what failure is because I think that's easier for me to define. Um, I like this. Failure to me is when you stop trying to do something. So as, as far as I'm concerned, if you are trying new approaches, you're succeeding because you're learning, you're testing a new hypothesis, you're approaching the problem from another angle to figure out what's going to work. If you stop trying, if you stop figuring out what, what approach to use and you just give up, mm -hmm. that's your failure, right? Yeah. Otherwise, everything else is leading to success because you'll figure out how to get there. If it's not a door, it's a window. Mm -hmm. Oh, I love that. 
I think that's genius. Um, <laughs> well, okay. You're going to get away with that answer because <laughs> that was a really, really good answer. No one said that to me before. And I ask this to everyone, hundreds of people I talk to every week. So I appreciate you being open with us and sharing your story. I know it takes a lot of courage to get on this platform and kind of just let your heart speak. And the fact that you're just out of pharmacy school, also shocking to me. Um, <laughs> I did not know that. I can't wait. I can't wait to meet you in person in a couple months um, at ASHP. And honestly, Sharon, congratulations on all your success. This, you are the definition of success. So kudos to you. I am honored that you took the time to, to speak with us and to speak with our audience. Thank you so much. It is my pleasure. This was just the beginning. If this was your first time listening to the RX Buzz, we welcome you and thank you for giving us a chance. And if you're an old friend, one of our subscribers, we cherish you and look forward to hearing from you. And now we need your help. We ask that you share this podcast with just one person you know who's in the healthcare industry. If this podcast can help just one person, we believe it will have a chain reaction, having an impact on dozens, hundreds, thousands, and someday millions of people. Thank you for your help. We truly appreciate you. And thank you for listening to the RX Buzz, part of the Pharmacy Podcast Network.